am, as Anya said, the director of the Charles Perkins Centre, and we have many aspirations and many interests in common with lifestyle medicine. And I thought it might be fitting to explain to you how we're going about trying to address these major societal challenges here at the University of Sydney. It's a story which I hope will illuminate and um, uh, certainly introduce some of the themes from the rest of the evening. So our mission, what we've been set up to do within the University of Sydney is here, Hamish uh, mentioned it earlier, it's to ease the burden of chronic disease, but in particular by taking a complex systems approach. Why should we need a complex systems approach to the, the burden of chronic disease? Well, the answer is illustrated here as well as anywhere else. This is the famous spaghetti map that came from the Foresight study in the UK, illustrating all of the influencing factors that ultimately contribute to, in this case, obesity. Things deep within the genes and the metabolism of individuals all the way through to the food supply uh, and the built environment. It's a really complex problem, which, to a first approximation, we've tended to deal with in public health by urging people to eat less and move more. And it hasn't worked. It clearly hasn't worked. And part of the reason for that is that we, like all animals, have evolved to minimise energy expenditure and maximise accessibility to safe and palatable foods. Any animal in the history of evolution that ran around needlessly or gave up perfectly acceptable food patches didn't have a long prosperity. So we're a perfectly normal animal in that sense, but we have one other fundamentally important trait, the trait that has yielded our greatest successes, and that's our brain. And what that's meant is that we could design a world to achieve all of our ancestral heart's desires. So we've bred our food plants and our food animals. We've designed our food supply and our food production systems to meet those things which were most limiting to us in our ancestral environments, energy-dense, fat and carbohydrate-rich foods. Our, our towns, our homes and our workplaces are beautifully designed such that we have to minimise our expenditure of energy. Our economic systems are designed to promote wealth, not health. And, for example, in the Darwinian marketplace of um, companies that produce food, those that sell most prosper, and so in turn do our um, insurance companies and our um, ultimately our um, own investments. And they do so by selling us the things that we want to buy, which are the things that need not ultimately do our health the best. Political solutions aren't easy either, of course. So prevention we know is better than cure, but cure does in the short term lead to sufficient profit or um, garner sufficient votes, often to make it um, really high priority. So it's much easier to put the onus back on the individual. It's your fault. You move too little and you eat too much. Um, but that's really an abrogation of responsibility, it seems to me, as, um, as a society, because if it was simply a failure of willpower, it's the greatest failure of willpower in the history of humanity. So what are we trying to do about it? What was the Charles Perkins Centre asked to deliver? Now, our namesake, Charlie Perkins, was a famous Australian Aboriginal activist who challenged prevailing views, worked across sectors, was an annoyance when he needed to be, and he got things done. He had impact. And it was that set of qualities to which we really aspire. So we were asked to bring the university together across all of its disciplines and its locations and to co-locate a critical mass, an intellectual mass, a practical mass, to address this major societal issue. To do so by building new collaborative relationships that cut across disciplines and to bring research and education together that had impact ultimately on, on health. And as part of that process to design, build, populate and run a, a signature new building, which is the Charles Perkins Centre hub, 
Research and Education Hub. So the hub, you're, you're sitting in a part of the hub, the main building you'll see just across the other side um, from where we're sitting now. It is an extraordinary building, cost the university and federal government $385 million. It's been open now for just over two years. It is now full. We have unallocated places in the entire building. It holds more than 900, 900 researchers, spanning everything from people working deep in metabolism and metabolic science, looking for common features of some of these chronic disease burdens, rather than treating them as independent medical conditions. And we even have philosophers and economists and people working in policy and agriculture and veterinary science and so on a really vibrant multidisciplinary community. We teach undergraduates in the building. Last year, we taught 150,000 student attendances in that building across 10 different faculties. We have our own clinic, which we run jointly with the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital under their clinical gov um, governance according to our academic strategy. And we have fabulous core facilities um, for research um, and for teaching. But it isn't just this building. This is a wonderful building, and I must say it is a, a superb environment within, to, um, within which to work. But it is not the entirety of the project. The project extends more broadly than that. So we have other regional hubs at Broken Hill, at Nepean, and at Westmead. And our strategy is structured around an architecture that doesn't embody the disease conditions as if somehow they were separable and different and treatable in their own right, but rather is structured around four major domains and six cross-cutting themes. So the domains are population health, the biology of disease, and as Hamish said, and Anya said as well, I'm a proper biologist, I don't um, construe the mouse as a model of humans, and that's the end of my biology. I've worked in locusts and slime molds and fish and all sorts of things. And there is inspiration to gain from the biological world and particularly from our ecology and the ecology surrounding us. We also need our colleagues in the humanities and the social sciences, and we all come together in integrated solutions. The themes that light up all those domains include nutrition, physical activity and sleep, the three major axes of well-being, and then we have themes in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, ethics, politics and governance of chronic disease, and complex systems and modelling that pervades everything, both as a technique and as a way of thinking. But the way that we've actually constructed a collaborative network of activity is to initiate this thing that we call the project node. Now, a project node is an invitation, essentially, to our researchers to come to us with the best project that they've ever conceived, the thing that they've always wanted to do, but because they're in a particular discipline, they didn't have access to cognate disciplines who would have helped them to do something really special. We help bring people together and construct these exciting new projects. And then we release those projects into our ecosystem, into our own ecology. So if you're going to be a member of the centre, you need to join or initiate one of these projects. Since 2012, in June, when we initiated the strategy, there are now 67 active project nodes. And you'll see some of them there, and you'll get a real flavour for their diversity if you look at them. And they even include, most recently, um, our writer in residence, Charlotte Wood, who's here working among us writing her new novel, which involves um, looking at ageing um, in three elderly women. And we've commissioned Alana Valentine to write a play. And it's a wonderful idea. What she's doing is she's interviewing wedding dressmakers all the way from the eastern suburbs out to western Sydney and getting their personal experiences of body image through dealing with their clients. A really interesting notion. And we'll put it on at the Seymour Centre in due course. Now, what I'd like to do now is I'm, my history is an ecosystem um, design in complex systems in biology, and I'm treating us as a complex system. And I'm going to show you a, a couple of slides which show how you can build and, and quantify and visualise the development of new ways of thinking, of collaborative networks. 
So what this shows is what's called the connectome of our members as of 2014. So at that point, we had 500 members. Now, what you'll see is each member is a dot, and some of those dots are joined by grey lines. Now, what that means is that those two people have published a paper together. That's a measure of output in the scientific academic literature. And you'll see that as of 2014, those 500 people, many of them joined us without having a history of collaborating with others within that network. Some had published before, and you'll see that grey line or those grey lines forming a, um, a network of collaborative outputs, some of which predated the centre, some of which had happened over the previous two years or year and a half. Let's fast forward one year. That's the Charles Perkins Centre network at the end of 2015. You'll see that there's now 1,000 dots, and the richness of connection, um, both quantitatively and qualitatively, is growing and growing exponentially, and we can see that continuing this year. That's the building of new collaborations, people who otherwise hadn't worked together who now are. And what I'm going to do is end on... Um, a picture which shows the development of the Charles Perkins Centre network to this point. Our first node that we introduced in 2012 was on the gut microbiome. It brought in a bunch of researchers spanning multiple disciplines, from clinical sciences through to microbial ecology. As that entered the system, it was on its own. But then, as other nodes came online, they joined up, and you'll see um, the community growing. And this is the development of the Charles Perkins Centre embryo. We're now getting to the point, as you see, um, where we're almost about to generate limbs and organ systems. The whole thing is going to start running around before long. And that's precisely what complex systems do. We are a complex system. We're addressing a series of complex problems in society. We need to take the thinking that comes with system science and has been the inspiration for biology, turn it now to the betterment of human health. So thank you very much. Welcome to this evening. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be a co-host for you here, and I very much look forward to hearing um, Joanna and our subsequent speakers. So thank you very much.